Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, at uh, Tour in Motion. Uh, you know, whether you're here in Toronto um, or anywhere else in the world, um, we're really looking forward to um, Dr. Malka Simkovich's uh, second um, session in this series on the Jews of ancient Egypt. Um, so I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much, Maxine. Good morning to everybody. Good to see you all. Um, just a small disclaimer before we begin, I lost my voice, so I'm not going to be um, I'm not going to be yelling as I usually do. Maybe some of you will be happy to hear that. Um, <clears throat> but I'm a little hoarse. I don't think I have COVID. Uh, anyway, so welcome back. I usually begin the second or third or fourth class in the series asking participants whether there was anything from the previous week or the previous week that was unclear, anything that they want repeated, clarified, explained. But because we are a very large group, I would prefer not to begin with any conversation about last week. If there is something that you absolutely do need clarified, please put it in the chat. And I am going to make sure that we leave a nice amount of time at the end of the hour, uh, maybe the last 10, 15 minutes for discussion. So you can feel free to ask questions about today's class or last week's class at that time. Last class, we uh, explored in a very general sense what life was like for the Jews in Egypt in the Second Temple period, beginning with 538 BCE, as we see all kinds of migratory patterns when Persia conquers Babylonia and Cyrus says to the Jews in Babylonia, you can go back to the land of Israel, to Yehud, to this province that will become Judea. And at that point, Jews are moving all over the place. They have mobility. And many of the Jews who leave Persia do not go to the land of Israel. They begin settling all across the Levant. What we're going to do this week and in the upcoming weeks is home in on particular communities and try to discern the unique nature of those Judean communities. And I'm going to start today by exploring two communities that are not very well known. One is the community of the Judeans in a small island in lower, sorry, in upper Egypt, but it's south, uh, an island called Elephantine. And then with our remaining time, we'll look at the Jews of Leontopolis, which we did discuss a little bit last week. Before we begin, I'm going to open with some general passages from our good friend, Josephus. I think I defended him a little bit at the end of last mm -hmm. class. And these passages are important because they contextualize what life was like for Jews in Egypt. And they really speak to the fact that by this third or second century BCE, the majority of Jews are not in the land of Israel. There are hundreds of thousands of Jews in the land of Israel, but to use an anachronistic term, Judaism, is a global religion. And the reason why I say it's anachronistic to say that is because religion was not a word that was commonly used in the ancient world. You have the Roman religio, but religio uh, in Latin would have referred to the legal sort of uh, the, the official religion or religious practices of the Roman empire. Uh, what the Jews were, well, even today, we don't know if you follow the news and you know what's going on with Whoopi Goldberg, nobody seems to know what Jews are. And that's because whether you use the words race, nation, faith, people, these are not on their own sufficient to describe the Jewish people. And these questions about what a Jew was were being asked as soon as Judaism was an ism. And that term arises in the second century BCE. As soon as there is this idea of Judaism being something that goes beyond the ethnogeographic identity of those who live in Judea, you have questions about who these people are, what they are. Those questions remain unresolved, I would say. All right, so let's take a look at Josephus, and I'm going to share with you the source sheet, which as usual, I made small changes to, um, so I'm going to share my screen with you. And like I said, these first, two, uh, these first two sources speak about the spreading of the Jews in the second temple period. And to support his points, Josephus likes to cite 
Greek and Roman historians. And here he cites a first century BCE uh, historian named Strabo who speaks of the Jews. And one of the most famous lines that uh, Strabo says about the Jews that's cited in Josephus is that wherever you go in the Roman empire, you will find not a, not a, a Jew, but you will find a synagogue. And that of course speaks to the robust uh, settlements all across the Roman Empire. So anyway, um, this is what Strabo says, as cited by Josephus about the Jews. By the first century BCE, the Jewish people have made their way into every city. It is not easy to find any place in the habitable world which has not received this nation and which it has not made its power felt. And I think we spoke a little bit last week about this ambivalence that people had towards the Jewish people. On the one hand, they're rising the ranks of their host governments, they're participating in public life. And yet there are a lot of things that the Jews don't go to. They stay home during the festivals. They don't participate in every aspect of public life. And yet they're powerful. And this was the cause of confusion and resentment. It has come about that Cyrene, which is in modern day Libya, close to Egypt, which had the same rulers as Egypt, it's part of the Ptolemaic Empire and imitated it in many respects. This was a major, major center for Jews. So what would be today modern uh, North Africa. And in these communities in the area of Cyrene, there were Jews who observed the national Jewish laws. By this, he means probably the main three identifying markers of Jewish practice in the ancient world, uh, circumcision, dietary law, and the Sabbath. But then Strabo goes on and says as follows. In Egypt, territory has been set apart for Jewish settlement. And in Alexandria, a great part of the city has been allocated to this nation. So what it means uh, a territory has been set apart for a Jewish settlement is unclear. It could be an allusion to Leontopolis, which is where Onias, remember we spoke about this last week, Onias, the priest from Jerusalem, gets official permission from Cleopatra and Ptolemy to build a settlement at Leontopolis. But even in the great city of Alexandria, a big part of the city has been allocated to this nation, and they even have a ruler called an ethnarch. Uh, there are different versions of this word. There's also references in Josephus to a genarch, whether a genarch and an ethnarch was the same position or two distinct positions, we don't know. But in the similar manner that you would have a nasi or someone who is a religious leader of the Jews, but also a mediator between the Jewish community and the broader occupying host government, that was his position. And you can imagine it was very, very difficult and tricky position. One had to be a scholar and also a diplomat. And this ethnarch governs the people and adjudicates suits and supervises contracts and ordinances like a judge, as if he were the head of a sovereign state. And so this nation has flourished in Egypt because the Jews, and this is fascinating, the Jews were originally Egyptians. And because those who left that country made their homes nearby, they migrated to Cyrene. And because this country bordered on the kingdom of Egypt, as did Judea, or rather it formerly belonged to that kingdom. So in other words, Strabo says, the Jews are so successful in Egypt and they're given so much liberty, freedom, power to establish themselves almost in a semi-autonomous or fully autonomous way. And the reason for that is because the Jews have Egyptian origins. And so Strabo knows, maybe he's not sitting around reading the book of Exodus, but he knows that there's a very close tie between the people who come from Judea and who originally come from Egypt and the, the uh, native Egyptians. There's a very close kinship there. And we actually have many Jewish sources from the first century BCE, first century C, that talk about this, this kinship. It created a lot of um, tension in Jewish thought because of course we know from Deuteronomy that the Jews were not allowed to resettle in Egypt. And yet they're, part of that is because there's this deep draw towards it, right? Even in the wilderness, the people say to Moshe, we, we wanna go back, this is, this is our home. And Moshe is like, no, it's actually, in fact, not. <laughs> so there's all this, this like draw back to that cradle of civilization. I wanna uh, point you to, um, uh, another uh, passage in Josephus, the truth is, is that this is a little bit of a mistake because uh, these are overlapping um, passages. So I'm actually not going to do this second. I have to fix this. See how I have Antiquities of the Jews 1472 and 1472. I have to fix that. So this is just a little bit more <laughs> expanded version of the source above. So I think I'm going to keep going. 
and let's talk about elephantine. Okay, so before we go to this fascinating document, and please note that if I am, uh, that, that I'm not um, checking the chat. So just keep that in mind, uh, at least for the next half hour, I won't be checking it. You can post, but I won't see, especially if I'm sharing. All right, so now let's look at the fascinating world of elephantine. I said last week that the Jews of Elephantine probably settled sometime in the sixth century BCE. I pointed to some sources in Yermiahu and Jeremiah that talk about Judeans following the fall of the temple, going to Egypt. And I wanna nuance some of my comments. Uh, it is very possible, likely in fact, that there were Judeans in Egypt, maybe not specifically in Elephantine, but Judeans going down to Egypt even in the seventh century BCE. So let's back up. Elephantine, as I said, located in Southern Egypt, also known confusingly as Upper Egypt, was um, sort of came into the academic fore in the early 20th century. In 1907 and 1908, there were excavations on this island. And these excavations revealed a very significant cache of ancient papyri, which was not limited to, but which included a very large and significant collection of Aramaic documents. These documents were produced by a small community of Judeans who lived on the island, which was called Geb. It was not called Elephantine. And the community that the papyri reflect lived over the course of about 100 years from the late 6th century BCE through the 5th century BCE. And so that's why I said last week the Jews of Elephantine settled probably in the exilic period in 6th century BCE. And the documents that we have date to the following century after that. I know this is very confusing and I'm not showing you a timeline. So if anybody wants to unmute themselves, and you can um, just say say that again. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, but the papyri Wait, that we have, yes, anyone? Can you say what the name of that place is. You said Geb, Gel? Yeb, Yeb, Y-E-B. That's what the that's what the island was called by the Judeans who lived there. Okay. Yes. Thank you for asking. That's a good clarifying question that you can jump in and ask. But if you, you say, you know, can you please pontificate on the relationship between Elephantine and the Jews of Cyrene? Let's hold on to those questions uh, for later. So yes, I'm going to be citing uh, Bitsy Porton soon, but first I'm going to give you some more background. So the papyri that we have date to about the first hundred years of the second temple period from the late sixth century BC through the fifth century BC. And what's incredible is that these documents are dated. And I know that we think about, I mean, for obvious reasons, we think about, you know, the Tanakh and how the Tanakh precedes much of it, the community of Elephantine, right? But it's important to remember that when we're talking about ancient manuscripts, nothing is earlier than Elephantine. Nothing. When it comes to Judean Jewish history, this is as old as it gets. More ancient than the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date probably to the first century BC, first century CE. So this is enormously significant. We don't have manuscripts from the first temple period. So this is just an unbelievable, like nearly miraculous discovery, really incredible. Now that said, just because the papyri date to the first hundred years of the second temple period, it doesn't mean that there weren't Judeans beforehand. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that. It could have been, and, and Porton, for example, does suggest this, that community of Judeans first settled in the region in as early as the mid seventh century BCE, as part of a military garrison, which arrived from Judea during the time of uh, King Manasseh to support their allies, the Egyptians. And at that time, the king would have been Psamtic or Psameticus, as he's later known by the Greeks. Psamtic reigns from 664 to the end around 610 BCE. And so King Manasseh sent Judeans down to Egypt to support this Egyptian king. 
against the Assyrians, who, by the way, end up being conquered by the Babylonians. It's all very complex in the seventh century BC. You have the Egyptians, you have the Assyrians <clears throat> who, are being, who are in conflict with the Babylonians, complicated. But Judea, as is so common, is caught in the middle of this conflict and, uh, and sends a garrison of Judeans down to Egypt to support this king. So that probably was phase one of this migration back down to Egypt. And of course, if you know anything about King Menashe, you would have known that he probably is not worrying about what Devarim says because he was not considered a pious king. And so even if Judeans knew, well, we really shouldn't be going down to Egypt, our scriptures say that, nevertheless, we do all kinds of things that uh, maybe we know we shouldn't do. Um, okay, and, and let's uh, move on because I really want to get to the text. But the second wave of migration was probably the one that we discussed last week in the wake of the fall of the first temple. So as the Babylonian empire conquers Judea, and remember it's enemies, its great enemy is Egypt. They begin the process of exiling the Judeans in 597, all the way to the, for the next 12 years to 586 BCE. The Judeans are being forced east, right? But some were able to flee to Egypt. Remember, Yirmiyahu who talks about that, and we have references in Yirmiyahu, Membet, Memgimel, Mandalad of him, and Baruch, his scribe, and some followers and some idolaters that he's not on good terms with. They end up in Egypt. That would have been migration number two. Migration number three would have been um, uh, later in the, the sixth century BCE during the Babylonian um, during the Babylonian exile. This is a theory by a very great historian, Victor Cherikover. I highly recommend his ancient, <laughs> not his ancient book. It is an old book from the 1950s, but the uh, Hellenistic Civilization of the Jews is still a classic. And he suggests that the, there were Judeans who had stayed in Judea even after the fall of the first temple. We know that to almost certainly be true. And that Judeans continued to come down um, to Egypt and help the empire against uh, the Ethiopian uh, enemy. Okay. It could be that Judeans even continue to come after this. And here's where Elephantine comes in. The waves of migration that I just discussed don't have necessarily specific relationship with the community of Elephantine. It could be that some of these Judeans ended up at Elephantine, but it seems that the papyri that we have reflect the community of mercenaries or of, of officials who were Judeans, but worked for the Achaemenid Persian empire. So the Persians, and this, this again, I don't want to like get bogged down in all this, but the Persians had a military presence. They occupied the region in the 6th century BCE, the late 6th century BCE to the 5th century BC, and Judeans worked for them as officials, as mercenaries, though. They worked for the Persian Empire, and it, it seems to be that the Judeans of Elephantine had a, had a relationship with these, the, the military governors of uh, Persia who supported, the, who um, occupied the region. So all of that is background. The actual archive of documents, and here I'm going to do some show and tell, because I have Bitsy Porton, Basala Porton's fantastic and highly recommended book, The Elephantine Papyri in English, which has a very, very important introduction and lots of great commentary. This is not the cheapest, but it's a great investment. Um, and so I'm going to be referencing this today because I didn't want to make your source sheet 20 pages. Uh, but the archives of the documents discovered in Elephantine, first of all, they're not only Judean. There are other later papyri that belong to uh, other you know, Egyptians, Greeks who lived in the region as well. Um, and they reflect all kinds of day-to-day, -day, almost like generic uh, records, contracts, property sales, loans, betrothals, transfer of property, donations, social activities, ritual practices. So it's not like the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Which mostly I would say reflect a library belonging to that sectarian community, the Essenes we think, but had some kind of authoritative status for that community. Some of what we find at Elephantine was um, personal archives of families. And the most famous of this was a collection of texts belonging to a man named Hanania or 
Ananias, if you want to be fancy and say in the Greek way, but Hanania. Hanania married an Egyptian female slave that he later freed. And we have his documents. He transferred property to her. And some of those documents are extremely affectionate the way he talks to her. He says, I give you this apartment out of love. We're going to look at some of those texts, not in the source sheet that you have. I added it at the last minute, um, as is my maybe not admirable practice. Um, so that is one of the very fascinating things about Elephantine is it's, um, it's mundaneness that it tells us about daily life. Sacred texts are beautiful and important, but this gives us such a texture to what it would have been like for just an average regular Judean in the fifth or sixth century BCE, what their life would have been like. And so Hanania, the son of Azariah, right? These are Judean Hebrew names, marries an Egyptian slave woman. Her name is Tamet, T-A-M-E-T -E is how scholars write about her. And there are 50 years worth of documents belonging to his family. And you can imagine again, you know, you're sort of watching the development of his own life, his marriage, his um, estate planning, very, very fascinating. But uh, I'm not going to, oh, you know what I forgot to tell you? That we have in our class, oh no, I'm very embarrassed because I wanted to mention this at the beginning of class and I forgot. <laughs> uh, after last week's class, a member of our Torah and Motion group emailed me and said that she learned about Elephantine in undergrad, I think at Rutgers, and she wrote a paper in 1972 on Elephantine, and I hope it's okay to say her name, uh, Judy Carta. I think this is the coolest thing in the world. I'm sorry, Judy, I did not have time to read your whole paper. But in 1972, one of our esteemed participants in Torah Motion wrote a fantastic paper uh, in college on, um, on Elephantine. So I'm speaking to experts. I just thought that that was really great. <laughs> I'm loving this. <laughs> oh, is that you, Judy? I don't know. Yeah, yeah oh, that's fantastic. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. It's fun. Uh, so what we're going to do now is take a look at some of these papyri. I am going slow today. There's no way I'm going to get to this all, but I want to, uh, <laughs> I want to just do what we can do. And I'm going to start with something that you might all think is very heretical. And, uh, it, that is the temple of the Judean community. The fact is, is that Jewish, that's anachronistic. No one said Jewish in the fifth century BCE, but I'm going to say it. Jewish temples outside of Jerusalem existed in the second temple period. And this is the most important part. Those temples were not established by heretics, assimilationists, apostates, but by Judeans who lived outside the land of Israel, who could not make it to the Jerusalem temple and offer sacrifices in the way that they wanted to. These were God-fearing um, Jews, or you would say Judeans, who observed their ancestral laws, Sabbath, dietary law, circumcision, and they truly thought, there's all evidence points to the fact that these Judeans truly thought that it was an act of piety to worship their God by offering sacrifices through the mediating oversight of a priest at a temple that was not the Jerusalem temple. Again, you should be shocked by this because there's so much material in our Tanakh that says do not build bamot, right? You don't get to have backyard altars. You can't go to your backyard and just get a cow or a sheep and slaughter it and say some prayer to the God. You have to go to the Jerusalem temple. And yet our lives are full of contradictions. And these communities truly viewed themselves as pious and observant. And there was a temple at Elephantine, just like there was a temple of Anias in Leontopolis. Now, I spoke a little bit about anti-Jewish violence, anti-Judean violence, animosity that was rising in uh, the Hellenistic diaspora throughout the late Second Temple period. And I'm going to show you a text that might be the earliest documentation of such animosity. This text is a letter that one of the leaders of the Judean community in Elephantine named Yedanya. Note those names. These are names that are Hebrew, right? This is an Aramaic document. That doesn't tell us anything religious, though, because Aramaic was the lingua franca of the Persian Empire. This is an Aramaic document from a man named Yedanya, one of the leaders of the Elephantine community. And he writes to a governor in Judea. There's a big, Yehud would have been the name of the Persian province. There's a big question. Was this governor Jewish? You know, like 
Gedalia, right, was sort of working for the Babylonian Empire, but he was Jewish. Is he like a puppet king or is he actually a Persian official in Judea? I am <laughs> not an expert, but there are reasons for me to think the, the tone of the letter is intimate. There's a, there's a tone of kinship. So my intuition, and I'm not Batsala Porton, I am not an expert on Elephantine, but my intuition is to say that this is a, a Judean with a Persian name uh, because there is this very intimate tone. Again, you can make your own decision because we, we just don't know. So Yudanya writes Bagavachya is the name of the governor of Yehud. And there's a crisis that he's writing to the governor about. And the crisis is that the Judean temple has been destroyed at Elephantine. And it's been destroyed by Egyptian priests of the god Khnum who lived nearby on the island. Probably this was just uh, a territorial dispute uh, born from animosity towards these Judeans. Like, what are you doing here? Why do you think that you can have your own community and build this temple to this foreign God that we do not recognize? And Yudanya is writing to Bagabachia asking for him permission to rebuild the temple at Elephantine. I can see by the way, at this pace, we are not even gonna like, we're just dipping our toes, but this is okay. This is the right pace to go at. And so the question is, do we have permission to rebuild our temple? And just the, just the question tells you that there's no sort of discomfort with the existence of the temple itself. There's no, uh, you know, like we, we kind of know this is a bad thing and we, there's no shame here. We have this temple that reflects our loyalty to Judea and to our ancestral mm -hmm. God, but we need your permission to rebuild it. Let's look at this letter. Okay. Oh no, those are, that's my notes. <laughs> Hold on one second. I mean, you could read my notes, but um, I wanna give you the illusion that's all just off the top of my head. Okay, do you see this? Do you see uh, Tarlord Bagavachia? Yeah, I need some nodding. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so this is a standard Semitic uh, style where you open up with the name of the addressee, Tarlord Bagavachia, governor of Yehuda. Your servants, right? So you start with the name of the person you're writing to, and then you go, then you name yourself. Your servants, Yadanya and his colleagues, the priests who are in Elephantine, the fortress, the Persian, right? The, the Persian military garrison. And then he opens up with the bracha, the welfare of our Lord, may the God of heaven seek after abundantly at all times. May God bless you. May he grant uh, you with favor before Darius the kings. And again, this is dated. This is 407 BC. Unbelievable. We have the date. May God. Um, give you a long life and happy and strong may you be at all times. Very typical to open up an Aramaic letter with a lovely little blessing. But he gets right down to business after that. He says, listen, we have a situation over here. The priests of the god Chnum, I, I think it's Chnum. I think that that might be a typo. So hold that thought. Um, I'll have to look it up. I think that that's a typo. Who are an elephant in the fortress. They said, we don't want the temple of the Jewish people, the Judeans near us. Let, let them remove it. You guys, you have to just take your temple elsewhere. And one of the leaders of this initiative to get the Judeans to dismantle their temple is um, an individual by the name of Vidranga. And he sent a request to Persian leaders saying, you have to let us destroy the temple. We do not tolerate this other Judean temple there. Apparently, Vidranga did not get permission to do so, but nevertheless led the charge in vandalizing the Judean temple. And Yudanya describes to Bagavachia how extensive this damage was. They came to the fortress of Elephantine with their implements. They broke into our Judean temple. They demolished it. The pillars of stone that were there, they smashed them. There were five gateways of stone built of hewn stone, which were in that temple. They demolished it all. The standing doors, the hinges of the doors. I mean, I think that the effort here is to say that this costs a lot of money to rebuild and there was a extensive damage. It's gonna be a major effort to find the funds and the energy to rebuild this. This was serious, a, a real, maybe not, uh, scholars think this was a partial dis destruction, not a full destruction, but certainly was devastating to those Judeans who lived there. And he says, and Yudanya says in his letter, this was an ancient temple that was sanctioned by the Persians. It was legally there. We didn't build illegally, but we, the Persians had always <clears throat> allowed it and permitted it. And now all we're asking is for your permission. Oh, and then he says, and by the way, the Persians who love us and permit us to have that temple there, 
punished Vidranga. They did not support this Egyptian's initiatives, right? Vidranga is not Persian. He's an Egyptian, I believe, who was an administrator of the Egyptian temple. And the Persians punished him. They said, no, Vidranga, you did a very bad thing. We allowed the Judeans to have our temple. And in fact, according to this letter, Vidranga was killed. Uh, I don't know, but I, that's what the letter says. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, Yudanya says, we've already contacted you about this tension that we've had for a very long time with the local Egyptian priests, and you have not answered our letters. We've asked you for guidance. So even before this evil was done to us, even before this temple was destroyed, we've been talking to you, we've been reaching out to you for support about this conflict. We sent a letter to Yehochanan, the high priest, and his colleagues, the other priests who are in Jerusalem, and someone named Ostares, the brother of Anani, and all the nobles. They're not running back to us. We need to know that we have an ongoing kinship. This is why I think that Bagavachia might have been Judean, because Yedanya assumes that Bhagavacha has this relationship with the priests of the temple. And he's saying, listen, I've been reaching out to the Judean community. I really need to hear back from you. If, if Yedanya is writing to Bhagavacha and that letter was dispatched to Yehud, why do we have it in Elephantine, right? Like if you send a letter, you don't keep the letter. The answer is that there, was a, there were scribes who would make copies of letters that they would dispatch. And we actually have two versions of this letter copied by a Judean scribe in Elephantine. So this is not the actual papyri that Bagavachia read, but it's a version. What's interesting is that the two versions that we have that the scribe wrote down for their own archives are a little different. So you could see, if you if you look at Port Porton, you could see very interesting ways in which um, the scribe is sort of playing with language and trying to ingratiate himself into Bagavachia's eyes and trying to really beseech him to get involved. And he says, listen, all we're asking is for you to give us permission to rebuild the temple. Now, is this, is this political permission or religious permission, right? It's not political permission because the Persians have already allowed it. There has to be some kind of religious sanction. In other words, we believe in our Elephantine temple, we believe in its legitimacy, but we still need to know that the Judeans who administrate the Jerusalem temple are okay with it. This is not necessarily political permission, right? This is, we are all kin, and we wanna make sure that you're on board with the situation. Perhaps you might take the destruction as a, you know, some kind of reflection of divine intervention. We wanna make sure that you know that we're doing this. We want, we want you to be on board. And so he says, just write back, may a letter from you be sent to us, to them about the temple of the Judean gods that we can re rebuild it. And why do we wanna rebuild it? Because it's a marker of our loyalty to you the meal offering, the incense, the burnt offering, we're going to offer sacrifices in our common God's name. And we will pray for you, all of us, our wives, our children, all of us. So please send us, <clears throat> send us a letter letting us know that you're on board with this. And now I wanna show you the papyrus. Look at that, look at that. In your source sheet, the image that I included is not the letter. So I changed the image and I can send this out again. Look, like you see the fibers, look at that. Can you imagine being Bitsal? Oh no, <laughs> I just went too far. Can you imagine being Bitsal Porton and having to, what happened to my, where's my image? Oh, there it is. And having to decipher this. Look at this, RMA, unbelievable. Incredible. So I'm glad that this is not my job and that someone has done it for me. I want to point out <laughs> the most fascinating part of this correspondence, which is the response, which we have in the Elephantine archive. Baga Bagavachia and an official with a Jewish name. So again, Bagavachia certainly has ties with, if he's not himself Judean slash Jewish, He's in that world because he's writing a response with someone named Delia, not a Persian word, not a Persian name. And he says, all right, okay, fine. You know, you can rebuild the temple that has been destroyed. To what ends? I'm going to ask everyone to please mute because there's some background noise. We have a lot of people on this call. So please mute. Thank you. To what end? What are you going to do on this rebuilt temple? Use it for meal offering and incense. Now. Who's a close reader of the text? I just asked you all to unmute, but now I'm gonna say you can, I asked you all to mute, but you can unmute to yell out the answer. Who's a close reader of the text? 
the no, response no. says, what's missing here? Hold on a second. The response says, you can use this temple and its altar to bring meal offerings and incense. No animals. What did, no animals. ah, what did Yudanya ask? Say it again. No animal sacrifice. Exactly. I don't know who said that, but that's spot on. Very, very, very good. Right. The request is not just to bring meal offerings, right? Grain. That would be a cheaper, sort of less distinguished form of sacrifice, incense. It's very expensive to bring animal sacrifices. This is a bigger deal. You needed more expertise, more time, more money, resources. And the response is, yeah, yeah, you, you can rebuild that temple for meal offerings and incense, right? In line with the prophetic warnings of the Tanakh, you do not bring animal sacrifices on Bamot in the backyard. This temple, according to Bagavachia and Delaya, is not to be a temple for animal sacrifices. And here you find significant tension. It's in the absence of what's not mentioned in this letter, where you see a little bit of rubbing together. What is the function of this temple going to be? But Gavachia doesn't say you cannot rebuild it, but there seems to be discomfort with the idea that there's a temple outside of the land of Israel that would be put into equal function as the Jerusalem temple. Ad Khan, that's not acceptable. You want to bring meal offerings or incense? You can do that. You are not given permission to bring animal sacrifices. And so here you see a dissonance between how the Jews or Judeans of Elephantine perceive themselves versus how the Judeans perceive them. What is an act of loyalty to the land of Israel? For the Jews in Elephantine, the act of loyalty is to bring animal sacrifices, make it exactly like the Jerusalem temple. For the Judeans and, the, and Yehud, no, that's not an act of loyalty. That's an act of um, separation. That's, an, that's, that's something that, that reflects disrespect. I want to show you what might be the most famous letter discovered on the island. It's known as the Passover letter. And I really do want to spend a few minutes on Leontopolis, although I won't feel terrible if we don't get to it because we discussed it last week. Probably the most famous letter discovered on the island is dated to 419 BCE. And the reason here, I'm gonna skip it so we can all see on one page, there we go. <clears throat> the reason why it's so famous is because it alludes to Chag HaMatzot, to the Passover holiday. Really, I should have included the original Aramaic. And this letter was written by Persian authorities permitting Yadanya, who was one of the leaders, again, of the Elephantine Judean community, permitting them, giving them official permission to observe Chagamatzot. Now, in the biblical, I've actually written on this for the Torah.com, in the biblical period, there was no seven or eight day holiday of Pesach. There were two distinct holidays, right? On the 14th of Nisan, you would offer the Korban Pesach. And then following that, you would have, uh, you would have the, the Chag HaMatzot. So listen to, to how this letter reads. To my brother Yedanya and his colleagues, the Jewish garrison. This is a little bit restored because there's letters that are difficult to discern. And again, this is from Porton. I think it's from this website, but from Porton. So your brother Hanania writes on behalf of the Persians. The welfare of my brothers. Again, we start with a bracha. May God seek at all times. Now this year, the fifth year of Darius, Word was sent from the king. And what does the king say to his official Hanania? Tell Yudanya and the Judeans at Elephantine that they can observe a festival of leavened bread. You can observe the Passover. From the 15th of, uh, to the 21st day of Nisan, you can observe the festival of level bread. And I think that this little line, such a throwaway line, but I love it because it's so sensitive. Be ritually clean and take heed. So I don't know if this comes from Hanania, right? Who's a Judean who is warning, reminding gently, Yudanya, we know you don't live in the land of Israel, but be careful, do this right. Because there's a little bit of tension again. Remember in the earlier letter, fine, you want to have your temple, you can have it, but you cannot even think for a second that it's like the Jerusalem temple. And here there's a little bit of like paternalism. I don't think that this sentence was written by Darius. This was probably inserted by Hanania, by a Judean who wants to make sure you're going to do this. We want you to do it. It's fine. You should observe this holiday, but let's be reminded about how you're going to do it. You're not going to do any work. 
you are not going to drink beer, right? Or anything leavened. Try not to uh, annotate, please. Thank you. Um, only because it's a little distracting. Okay. And, um, and keep it on these days. Do, um, do not have anything leavened, right? Do not bring that leavened material into your dwelling. Seal it up by order of King Darius. So again, there's a little bit of a degree of paternalism when it comes to the, these Jews in the diaspora and the Elephantine and their relationship with Judean officials who work for the Persian government, but who are based most likely in Yehud. And so whatever the relationship was between these diasporan communities and the Judeans who are officiating the Jerusalem temple and also have the ear of the Persian king, the relationship is not a relationship of equals. And this is a dynamic that is going to be perpetuated through the second temple period, where Jews, especially in Egypt, view themselves as really legitimate participants in their ancestral tradition, very attentive to their scriptural texts, observant of Sabbath circumcision, dietary laws. And yet there is a lot of evidence that the Judeans did not perceive them as having the authority or the proper understanding of the ancestral traditions that they had. Now, just for fun, I added a source that is not on your source sheet. Remember when I mentioned to you the archive of Hanania, the son of Azariah, and his wife, Tamet, who was an Egyptian slave. So just this morning, I know it's not nice, I keep adding things. Just this morning, I added the source only because the image of the papyrus is so unbelievable, not because the source itself is so fascinating, but this document is just um, a, a, a property transfer document. Uh, Hanania says, to a lady, Tamet, I give you, now remember she was not born Judean. Now, whatever conversion meant, it did not mean what you know, the rabbis talk about when they say conversion. She probably lived as a Judean, but she was not born as a Judean. And he says, I give you half of the large room of our house and its chamber or the house which I brought from, and I don't know how to pronounce that name, the daughter of Shabbat Bara, uh, and from Bagazushta, Caspians of Elephantine. I'm sorry for the typo. This is literally typing 45 minutes ago, the fortress. I, Hanania, gave it to you in love. Yours it is from this day forever and your children's whom you bore me after you. I think that's lovely. And now be prepared to be amazed. Look at that. That's the whole document. Incredible. Yeah. Oh no, that keeps happening. So I'm gonna stop zooming in. It's just unbelievable. <laughs> Look at that. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm sure he had a scribe write it for him. So we are going to move on. Look at that excavation of Elephantine. They have not excavated the temple. That's just the ancient site. It's not the temple itself. Okay, and you can see modern dwellings that are right nearby. You can see the water. It's not a big island. <clears throat> Incredible. All right, it's 1015. And so I wanted to just say a few minutes about the land of Anias. Again, not feeling too bad that we're not spending a lot of time on it today because we did discuss, oh yes, of course, I'll share the revised source sheets after the program. Um, and you can also email me. Um, you know what, I'm just gonna put that in the chat before I forget, msimkovich at ctu. Uh, .edu. I got a lot of emails last week, but that's absolutely fine. Just please give me a day or two to get back to you. I can't always get back right away. So I'm not going to feel very bad if we don't do um, a lot on Leontopolis today, but I just want to say a few, a few brief words. So we looked at Josephus and his description of the circumstances mm -hmm. in which this community was established by Onias in the early second century BC. Remember Onias is the son of a high priest. He is a pi considered a pious man who runs into conflict with Hellenized Jews, alchemists, and Menelaus, and he has to flee for his life. And he asks Cleopatra and Ptolemy for permission to establish a temple at a site of an unused temple or for fortress. And Josephus cites the letter that Onias sent to Ptolemy and Cleopatra, of course, you can imagine there's a lot of scholarly debate about whether Josephus is embellishing or actually using a source, which is the authentic dispatch of Onias to, uh, to Ptolemy and Cleopatra. And I just don't know if I said this last week, but the description of Onias' temple 
is meant to underscore the extent to which he desired to make it look like the Jerusalem temple. And Anaya says in his letter, I'm going to model it after the Jerusalem temple. But Josephus, while he, while he acknowledges that Onias is pious in the sense that he is a he wants to observe the ancestral law. He also portrays this as a political decision because Onias had a mind to contend with the Jews at Jerusalem and he could not forget the indignation that he had for being banished. He wasn't really banished, but he had to flee. Accordingly, he thought that by building his, this temple, he would draw people from the land of Israel to the Antipolis. So he's recruiting. He's not saying to the local Jews in Judea, uh, sorry, the locals in Egypt saying, oh, look, I have this great temple. Come worship our God in this temple, he is trying to draw a migration pattern, right? And again, he's pious. And so this undermines, this complicates our idea of like, if you were good in the ancient world, you would never go back to Egypt. Well, that's not true. Onias was trying to get Jews in Israel and Judea to come to leave Judea and go resettle. It reminds me of Rabbi Riskin, who took his community and not from my side and went to a front. But that was the right direction. I don't know about this direction, going into the diaspora. Uh, but we don't know that this was successful. We don't have evidence of like a mass migration of Judeans who followed Onias uh, to Leontopolis, but we do know that he had a following. This was a very successful temple and it is very possible that people did follow him. Uh, remember, uh, and, and so I wanna say one more thing about that. So of course he has to intentionally make the temple look like the Jerusalem temple because it's all about legitimizing himself to Jews in Judea who are accustomed to viewing the Jerusalem temple as the sole authoritative temple. So of course he has to make it look like the Jerusalem temple, it's not necessarily simply a religious decision, but a political one. And then again, Josephus cites that, um, that verse, I think in Yeshayahu Yetet about the fact that one day there will be a temple to God in Egypt. But probably what the prophet meant by that was that all people would recognize the one true God, not that Judeans would leave the land of Israel and build a temple. Uh, in Egypt for themselves. Anyway, uh, let's see what else I want to do with you here. Um, one other detail that I think is fascinating is in response to the request to, re, to, to build a temple in Leontopolis, Josephus cites Ptolemy and Cleopatra's response. And the response is doubtful. You really want to do that? We're aware of that ruined temple in this place called Bobastic of the Fields. And is your God really going to like you building a temple in a place that's so wild and full of sacred animals? I mean, I guess if that's what you want to do, sure. But Ptolemy and Cleopatra don't view that site as particularly attractive. And so they're like, well, yeah, I mean, no skin off our back. We don't really think it's a very nice site, but sure, do whatever you want. So it's just an interesting little detail. And look at what has been found at Tel Yehudia. Look at that. Tons of pottery discovered at that site at the Tel which even today is called the Mound of the Jews, El Yehudia, the Mound of the Jews. I'm gonna wrap up here. I included a few rabbinic sources which reference Beit Chonia, the house of Ananias, because the rabbis knew that there are many Jews who observed their ancestral laws, who worshiped at this temple, and to the, to the point where it creates a major halachic conundrum. If, this is the question that I have in your source sheet, if you make a vow to bring a sacrifice, but then it turns out that the only place that you could bring that sacrifice is not the Jerusalem temple, but the temple of Anais, Beit Chonia, what's the worst sin? Should you break your vow and then you're guilty of breaking a vow, very big sin, and then just not bring a sacrifice at all? Or should you bring the sacrifice at Beit Chonia, the Antapolis, which is presumed is also a sin? Which is the worst sin? And so that's the debate. What the Gemara comes to include, you could look at that, I think it's the last source, is that if you bring a sacrifice and Beit Chonia, not only are you guilty of a sin, you incur karet. And so this much later rabbinic source suggests a much more negative attitude towards this temple. But while it was built, um, the temple was, the temple was, um, considered at least somewhat legitimate. I did forget there was one last source I wanted to show you. Oh, let's see if I can find it. It comes from Josephus and it has to do with the fact that in 73 CE, at the very end of the war, when it was clear that Judea had lost, 
some zealots, some Jewish zealots in Jerusalem called the Sikari, dagger wielders. So, so very sort of, I don't want to say violent Jews, but Jews who were leading the rebellion against Rome fled for their lives. Oh, here it is. Do you see that when Messiah was taken? The Sikari and other Jewish zealots who were fleeing for their lives in 73 CE at the very end of the war were trying to escape Roman execution. So where did they go? They went to Alexandria and they stirred up trouble in 73 CE. They went to Alexandria and they created so much disturbance and disorder, Josephus says, after the war that they were killing Jews that they felt were too loyal to Rome probably. And they tried to convince the Jews of Alexandria to rebel against Rome. Now this is very foolhardy in 73 CE. I would not have been interested if I lived in Alexandria in 73 in rebelling or throwing off the yoke of the Roman empire, but the Sicarii don't give up. They say, okay, well, we lost that war, but God wants us to defeat the Romans. And so they're trying to convince the Alexandrians to rebel against the Roman empire. The Alexandrians want none of it. Now, Lupus, the governor of Alexandria, hears what's going on, or he becomes aware of what's going on among these Jews in Alexandria, between the Sicarii who come from Judea and the locals. And he says, you know what? I'm going to do the very same thing that the Flavian family did to the Jerusalem temple. You guys are fighting with each other. You don't get a temple. And he destroyed the temple of Ananias. And so the temple of Ananias is destroyed by the Romans in 73 CE as a result of the war in Jerusalem and the rebels in Jerusalem who came to Alexandria to try to continue the sedition against Rome. That's a little detail that very few people know. All right, so we, uh, I see a lot of things going on in the chat and I think I'm going to just go through this a little bit, but I'm not gonna answer every question before Judaism was it considered Yahwism. I don't like that word to me. That seems like a very academic word. Like, even if you would say, I try not to say Y-A-H-W-I-S-M, but so what's that, right? Like, what would that have looked like? Yes, of course, Judeanism is not the same thing as the Judaism that was produced by the rabbis. It's very practicable, normative form of rabbinic law. You can't compare what the rabbis were doing and writing about in fourth century CE versus 400 BCE. I would call that Judeanism, but I don't, you know, this Yahwism to me, it's like, it's something that you find in articles, but it's also equally not defined. Um, we know that the Jewish civilization, Cyrene, goes back to the second century BC because that's exactly right. Two Maccabees. Sorry, you're looking at Saul's comment from Jason, the original book, not the book of the Maccabees, but two Maccabees. One Maccabees was written in Judea by someone who worked for the Hasmonean family, and it focuses on their heroism. But the book Two Maccabees derives from a, someone named J Jason of Cyrene, and he is the first person to use the word Judaism. Judaismos, that's the first book that uses that word in contrast to Hellenismos, which is a false binary that most Jews would not have understood. It's like if someone said to me, are you an American or, or a Jew? I would be like, I don't understand your question. <laughs> Maybe Whoopi Goldberg should read Strabo. That's funny. Okay, Strabo, known historian elsewhere. Yes, all right. Um, Bitsy Porton, Buzzy Porton spent his career on the papyri. Yes, he did. Okay. I'm just sorry. I'm just going through these questions. Um, could Devarim's prohibition of going down to Egypt have been a polemic against Menashe's military garrison? It depends how you cite Devarim. Fascinating question. I'm not going to, I'm not an expert on, on citing that, so, on the dates of scriptural texts. So I'm not going to go into that. It's a great question. Did the Jewish, Jewish garrison in Elephantine fight on Shabbat? What were the religious practices of these Jews? So we don't know whether they would have fought on Shabbat, but we do have parallel <clears throat> material from one Maccabees and two Maccabees produced in the second century BC that suggests that at that later stage, right? So 200 years after the Jews of Elephantine were running these archives, there's still an open debate about whether to fight on Shabbat. So the early followers of the Maccabees do not fight on Shabbat and they're massacred. And then Judah Maccabee says, you have to fight on Shabbat because you cannot martyr yourselves. So it's a live debate about what laws you can break on Shabbat and whether you could break Shabbat to save your life. That's a live debate in the second century BC. So I don't think that would have been settled in the fifth century BC, but I, we don't know the answer to your question. Um, the Elephantine Papyrian English, right? Okay, yes, thank you for putting the source of the book. 
uh, important, 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 very important, the most important scholar, I think, <laughs> on Elephantine. Uh, and let's see, I'm just scrolling down. You went with Rabbi Berman, very cool. Okay. Um, doesn't the Talmud record a conversation between some rabbis and an influential Jew about the fact that this man sacrificed a Passover sacrifice in Rome and they lack the power to stop him but fall short of saying it's a sin? Yes, I don't know the source of that. I remember a story about that. I'm sorry, I don't remember the source. All right. Um, given what I've written about Esther, I would see this history as proof that the original intent of the Esther story is to discourage Jewish life in the diaspora. Very interesting. That's, and I'm just going to weigh in here. I think that that's how Esther was read by Judean Jews. I don't know that that was the original intent of Esther, uh, but certainly by the second century BCE, um, there are very compelling reasons to think that Jews in Judea read Esther as an anti-diasporan book. If you wanna stay on after 10.30, I can go into why, what evidence I'm thinking of, but I don't know that the actual book of Hebrew Esther is anti-diasporan. I actually think maybe the lesson is that God is everywhere, even in the diaspora. But Jews in the second century BC reverse that message. That's how I read it. When and what were the circumstances of the end of the Leontopolis Temple? I just, oh, maybe I, maybe you wrote that just before I addressed it because it's in Josephus. Email me for the updated source sheet. Were there animal sacrifices in the first temple at Elephantine? Yes, seems that there were. Okay, who found the archives? Oh, what's his name? Um, Cowley? Well, I, don't, I don't remember his name. Uh, there are a couple of them, one with a W, one with Cowley. Actually, look it up, it's all important. Uh, but their excavations are being done by, I think, British Protestant scholars in the early 20th century. Whew, okay. The instruction for observing Passover, um, I'll put, yeah, uh, no mention of the Paschal lamb. Is this related to the prohibition against animal sacrifices in the diaspora? That's a fascinating question. Uh, but you have to, it's already 1026. I don't want to get into this. So somebody private messaged me and said, is the fact that there's no mention of the Paschal lamb in the letter related to the prohibition against animal sacrifices in the diaspora? It's a brilliant question. It's possible, but I can't say for sure that that's the case. Very, very, very intuitive question. All right. Now I'll put my email again in the chat. And I invite you to stay on in our remaining few minutes. Unmute yourself if you want to jump in and ask a question, not through the chat, but through your voice. Any questions? It, uh, Malka, can you please repost the, the link to your revised uh, source sheets in the chat? I don't. Or you're going to send that to the website? Yeah, uh, I mean, I guess I could. I could figure this out. Hold on one second. I, I don't know. Figure. Okay, send it to the website, and we'll get it later. Um, that sounds good. Or as I'm talking, I can do this for you, maybe. All right. Any other questions? Oh, wait a second. I am figuring this out. Hold on. Um, I have yeah. a question. Uh, please just jump in because I don't see everybody. And no, okay. I'm not able, I'm not the host. I don't know. Uh, it's not letting me add the link. So just email me. Yes. Okay. Uh, what about the errata straka, which are much earlier? Oh, and okay. So that, that, that literacy was quite widespread in Judea. That, uh, that literacy was what? So the Iran, Ostraka? So A-R-A-D, Arad, 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 Arad. Arad. The Ostraka. I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. I, I'm not saying that there's no Judean writing, but that's on pottery, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Those are inscriptions, right? So Ostraka, yes, for sure we have older Ostraka from Judea. Again, I'm not an archaeologist. Archeolo we have writings, right? Okay, so we for sure have, we even have, you know, coins in the first temple. We have Astraka, we have pottery with inscriptions, but this kind of archival writing, I, I, I don't know. It's archival, yeah. it's asking for, for wine and, and food supplies and more soldiers to come. And there's like over 150, it's fascinating. And there's been analysis done, handwriting analysis. There was at least six people in this group of 40 soldiers in the middle of the Judean desert who were writing. That's, that's amazing and fascinating to me, and I would love to know more about it. Oh, that's, a, that's the fortress at Arad, where have, at Tel Arad, where they have that little the little temple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I don't know if that means that literacy was high. I, I don't know you can extrapolate that. It, I think there was an article in, um, in Archaeology Today or something like that a few months ago that discussed this, and yeah. they reviewed the di different people that they saw letters from, and they came to the conclusion that literacy was high. I can look to see if I can find that and, and send it out. 
I remember oh, yeah. reading that within the past couple of months, I read something about that. I would love to see that article. My subscription to BAR just expired a few months ago, so I probably missed it and I would love to see that. And I didn't, I didn't want to make any comment about literacy. I think that there is scholarly consensus that at least among Judeans, literacy was relatively to other communities significantly higher. And there's a big debate over what, how authoritative information was transmitted. Was it transmitted orally or uh, written? It used to be like a generation ago that there was this idea that like oral transmission was considered the best manner of transition of transmission. But now many scholars think, well, yes, that's a rabbinic perspective, but perhaps in the second temple period, uh, it was considered uh, the, the ideal manner of authoritative scriptural transmission was actually via the written word. And so there is a lot of really interesting scholarship. I'm not, as you can tell, an expert on uh, the Arad Ostraka or other Ostraka from the first temple period. And I'm very grateful to learn more about that. Um, it's 1030, so I'm going to let you all go. This was really Can fun. you just spell Estraka? O-S-T-R-A-C-A. O-S-T-R-A-C-A. That Thank would you. be plural. And so there you go. Uh, uh, According okay. to this source I have, the, uh, the papyri in Elephantine were discovered in 1906. And the publication, the original uh, publication is 1925 in German by A. A. Gustavus or Gustav to Gustavus. Yes, and the excavations were 1907 and 1908. They actually knew about the site as a Judean site in the 19th century. So they knew that there was some Jewish life there. We have some interesting, um, you know, like scholarly discussion about the Judean community, but the excavation and the discovery of the papyri exactly happened uh, during that year um, and until 1908. Uh, what um, else do I want to say? Um, hold on one second. So I just, I just want to say next week is Alexandria. I'm very, very excited. There's just an enormous wealth of information that we're going to do. It'll be a lot of fun. Did somebody have one more question before we say goodbye? Yes, one quick question. The Leontopolis temple was destroyed in 73 CE? It, for sure, at the end of the war. It could have been 74. Oh. Right, you're talking, you're right in the wake of the destruction of the second temple. The okay. rebels went from Jerusalem to Alexandria and they tried to create some unrest, anti-Roman unrest. And then Lupus, the governor destroyed, this is what Jus Josephus says, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and we don't have corroborating evidence, but in this case, I don't see a reason to question it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so it's just a, a real fascinating testament to the connections between these yeah. communities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Malka. Thanks, everybody. Have Thank a you. Bye. See you next week. Bye-bye.